On this episode of the Massive Agent Podcast, you're going to hear how you can become an official sponsor of an NBA team and how the Funk Collection in Orlando, Florida became one of the biggest, most highest producing teams in all of Florida, and they've really never had to buy leads. So what the hell do they do? We'll talk about it today. What is up, guys? I'm here with Renee Funk, the team leader at the Funk Collection, powered by or brokered by EXP Realty. Renee, welcome to the Massive Agent Podcast. How's it going? Hey there, Dustin. Hey, everyone. Unbelievable. It's going unbelievable is how it's going. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I can't really get better. Awesome. Well, I'm going to do my best uh, to see if I can get even better than that, uh, at least for our listeners, for sure. Um, I'm excited to have you on the show today. You're somebody that I've I've seen from afar for a few years now. Even before I came to EXP, I knew uh, I knew about you, and I knew that you sponsored the Orlando Magic, and that you just you just had a very prominent uh, business in the Orlando area. And and so I, like now I'm excited to have the chance to just talk to you about how you built that. You know, what did you guys do, and what are you currently doing? What did you do to get to that point? So before we do that, Renee, why don't you take, you know, 30 seconds or so and just kind of give us a little bio of who you are, maybe what you did before real estate and then what you've done, you know, over your real estate career real quick, and then we'll jump into it. Absolutely. So Renee Funk, I am a team leader together with my better half, who I'm so grateful to be working together with Jeffrey Funk. Uh, he and I have been married uh, 20 years and we've worked together about 18 and a half of those 20 years. Wow. So when it's one of the most frequently asked questions we receive is how the heck do you work with your spouse that closely? We do. We love it. Wouldn't have it any other way. Um, reason I share that is for context to the fact that previous to being a realtor, I worked for, um, in the hospitality industry, I was both a flight attendant. And then I also worked at Disney cruise line. So love, love, love the travel industry, love customer service. And for several years, many years, Jeff would say to me, come on over and work with me. And I'd say, uh, uh, nope, nope. You got it. You're doing well. And then one day after being asked, nudged, and probably wet noodled, far too many times, I finally sat down and said, okay, I'll take a look at what you're doing. Let me look into what you're building in the back end. And I started to look at what he was building, which I'll share a little bit more about in a moment and realized he was absolutely onto something. He needed help. And so it was a little kicking and screaming, but I decided to come on board with him as an unlicensed assistant for the first few years. And then realized he finally said, you get your license or I'm hiring somebody else. And I said, okay. And so a little kicking and screaming, but I came in and it's one of his forever. I'm so grateful that he gets from me because I love being in real estate. This is one of the most magical industries. We have so much opportunity at our fingertips. And I cannot even imagine if I would have missed an opportunity to do exactly what we're doing right now. Isn't that interesting how when you look backwards at like these, the thin thread that connects all these different events and how, like, how, I don't know how you met him, but well, how did you meet him? Let's start there. Well, if he was here, he would say that I was his best ever in his lifetime online lead conversion <laughs> because we met online back in the days of AOL chat nice. rooms. Yes. <laughs> okay. So had you not logged on that one day or joined that one particular chat room or whatever, you know, your whole life would be completely different. And it's, it's just, it's crazy. So I, I love to hear that. And, and you've serendipitously found yourself in a place that you love and you obviously excel at. Um, I didn't know that about you. I, I didn't know that you, um, th that you came into the industry that way. So you got your license and yep. then, you know, when did you decide, Hey, I'm going to start servicing clients or were you more on the, the back end business side of things or how did that look? I've always been more on the back end business side of things. I I've really came into the industry with such a passion for the customer service side and the human side of the equation. And, and that's very different. Not to say that Jeff isn't focused on the human side, but we were a really great pair in the industry because He's the techie, 
In fact, when I reference what he was building earlier, I was referencing that in 2007, Jeff locked himself into a bedroom and built our website that still serves us to this day. We've had many iterations of that site over time, but our business is built um, largely on that website, which is SEO based. We do all organic traffic through our website, realtyinorlando.com. So he locked himself in a room back in 2007. Like we had a 1500 square foot condo. We didn't have furniture. It was like, some of it was plastic. I'm not kidding. Like the folding chairs, the whole nine yards, not in a really great financial situation. He locked himself in the bedroom, didn't come out for six months. Everybody told him he was crazy, including myself. And then one day it felt to a lot of us, the switch flipped and all of a sudden everything came in because back then people didn't have real estate websites. It was fewer and farther between. So as we progressed through in our business, I brought in the customer service element of it. Because of my passion, something I love about this industry is we must be tech forward. We must have our finger on the pulse, not only of current technology, but where the technology is going, but we have to stay rooted 100% in the human element of the tried and true relationship building skills. And that's where I come in. So we've married that in our business together. Um, as long as we've been working together and, it, and it's just worked for us to, to never lose sight of one or the other. They're two very important pillars in our business. So you guys decided, do you say 2007 is when you launched your website? Uh, first launched it. Yes. Okay. And so you was content marketing, like that was the, the plan back then? Uh, so our website is built on, and I don't know if it's content marketing. I wouldn't say that back then, what it was built on back then is a hyper local community focused, uh, content. So when you go to our website, for example, we're going to have data that the big portals don't, they don't have to this day, mm -hmm. right? Like he, thank goodness he had the foresight back then to say, we're going to go hyper local by the subdivision. So we have these nitty gritty details, number of homes, what each community has. So the big portals, they don't, they don't have that data and that's serving us. So long tail, long tail key phrases, super hyper local lifestyle related content specific to regions. Um, yeah, it's been a game changer for us. We've never really, we've, we've never really had to, to, buy online leads. And I, I do this because I cringe a little bit. I don't like the word leads. It's so dehumanizing. We call them right. customer inquiries. So whatever source that you meet people, um, whether it's online or otherwise, they're humans, they're customers, and we treat them differently when we call them different words. Lead to me sounds like cold and like no connection. And so I, I sometimes believe that that's why agents have a harder time because they feel like it's just some, some data and it's actually a human with dreams looking to find the next place that they're going to build memories with their family. It's a bigger, it's a bigger opportunity than I think a lot of agents sometimes give credit to. Yeah, and that's a fair point. Um, you're right. It's an lead is a word that I've used for so long, but that's coming from a marketing perspective of like agents, like I can help you get these things, whatever you want to call them, like, you know, customer inquiries in the eyes of most agents are like, what the hell is that? Like I want to yeah. lead. I don't, I don't want a customer inquiry, Dustin. I want to lead. So, but I, I completely agree. And Grant Wise, a friend of mine, he calls them, um, instead of leads, it's a um, client generation. Like he's, he's teaching people how to generate clients and people to work with. They're not just leads. So I, I, I love that. And I do get the eyebrow, you know, from time to time, because as an industry, we don't, agents don't know to your point. Well, what is a customer inquiry? What the heck does that mean? Right. We know what online lead gen mean. We know yes. what lead gen means, but I believe and call it a bit of a soapbox, call it, you know, pie in the sky in my, my, my brain that if we call it a different word, our words matter, then we will behave differently. And I also think that there's a bit of a challenge in the industry that there are oftentimes a value proposition that some team leaders, some brokerages, some organizations will put out as the biggest part of their value prop. And they put a huge spotlight on it and they say, I have leads, I have leads, I have leads. Here's the challenge. What does a lead mean to you? Because a lead customer inquiry is really just whatever source it is. It's a knock at the door of an opportunity and the agent's job 
to humanize it is to open the door and earn the relationship to help them achieve whatever their home ownership goals are. And when you look at it differently like that, then this spotlight of leads shifts. Cause I could say that all day long. I have leads, 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 but I actually need a human to build and earn the relationship to help them. I don't need someone to think of it as like just a, you know, a profile on a, on a CRM. It's a human. Right. It's an at bat for a conversation, you know, it, so, it, and that's important because you're right. It's, it's way too easy. If you don't have that perspective if, and if you're not thinking of it that way, to just like, well, I'm just going to automate everything. I'll just put them on a drip campaign. And if it spits out, uh, you know, a live human being on the other end, awesome. But if not, then, you know, nothing. And I think that's underserving the consumer. And it's also underserving you as the business owner, because you're leaving a lot of business on the table. So. It's also created a misconception that um, we all know we can procure real estate licenses fairly easy in, in just about every state. It's a low barrier. I'm a perfect country, example. For the most part. Yep. Perfect like, example right here. I don't know about that, Dustin. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Anyways, yes. But so it's so having a real estate license, low barrier of entry overall, right? Yes. So the challenge though is, is that when we as whomever we are, team leaders, industry leaders, however you want to call yourself, rainmakers who have business to give to others. When we set the wrong expectation to say like, I have all these leads that I'm just going to hand to you. The challenge for a lot of realtors is they don't realize that makes it sound like it's a transaction on a platter. And if it was that easy, then exactly what we don't want to happen in the industry, which is that the realtor can be taken out of the equation. That's essentially what that would do. But the reality is, is all of these opportunities, the door knock analogy is it is door knocking. It's a door knock for your opportunity. And then we, as the realtor step in and say, I'm going to earn the relationship. Yes. And we've just found in, you know, the way we navigated our business is the way we shift our mindset around it has completely changed the way we serve our customers. I'm glad we I'm glad we went down that road because I think that's an important distinction to make and and just perspective that agents need to have in the front of their minds as they are generating leads or whatever they want to call it. Yep. Uh, yeah, they're at bats for conversations. They're you know and, and that's important. Um, okay, so I want to talk about then this this platform you've built, this website, and you know you have all this data at such a granular level in, at, with the subdivisions, and the portals don't have it. I imagine. I mean, and Google has changed dramatically, as you guys well know, better than I do, how dramatically Google's changed since the late 2000s. But you guys have been able to stay in front of that or on top of that and iterate as you go along. Uh, what's, if you could look at like why the whole thing works, why you're still, after all these years, still able to get business from your website the way you've done it, what are some of those overarching themes that uh, that anyone no matter if they have a website or not, or they're doing social media content or not, can learn something from? Very simple. It doesn't matter if you're talking about a website, if you're talking about building organic content, if you're talking about your social media, if you're talking about Zillow leads, whatever path, door knocking, Fizbos, you name it. All of this answer can be summed up with one thing, consistency and good habits. So with us and our website, we've stayed consistent. We've, we've iterated upon iterated. We continue to add community data. Um, one example is in March of 2020, we all know what happened, pandemic. There was a lot of uncertainty, but there was one thing in the world of Jeff and Renee that was very clear. We had not one iota of uncertainty. The moment we realized what was happening, even though we had a list, a scroll of questions that were pretty scary, there was one thing we looked at each other and said, we know exactly what to do. And we tripled down on content. So we set out, um, we went under contract to launch a custom website. And so we just relaunched our site. Um, I think we went under contract. We had it up within a matter of a couple of months. So we relaunched our site in 2020, fully custom. 
Then we had a goal of doing about, I think their original goal, because I say they, I mean Jeff, and he has um, staff and contractors that he brings on to help do the content. We have copywriters, all the things, right? Photography, everything you need for the web content. They originally set out to do about 100 new communities in 2020. And in fact, we came in at 300 plus new communities that were added to realtyinorlando.com in 2020. Wow. Damn. So consistency and good habit means just keep putting the content out, whether, whether it's social, whether it's whatever is really speaking to you to, to dive into. It's the not so secret sauce. See, whether COVID happened or not, that would have been the right strategy, right? And what it's crazy that a year has gone by already since COVID really like hit. And by the way, I was in Orlando beginning of March, 2020. I was at um, PodFest at the World Center Marriott. Okay, yeah. Um, and that was right when things are getting weird. Um, just made it home. And then like a week later, you know, everything changed. But um, I, I remember doing a bunch of podcasts and, you know, everyone's like, are we even going to have jobs like are we gonna like is anybody gonna survive this thing because there was just so much uncertainty about what was about to happen and one of those themes was when so many of our competitors are laying down because they're they're scared they're uh, they're nervous they just don't know what to do so they do nothing like that was the majority of our competitors anyone who dives in and just like starts doing more and doubling down and spending more on ads you're going to be seen more often because what was everyone doing when they were stuck in their house. They were on their phones all day. They were on yeah. social media and the internet all day. Yeah. And so whoever did what you guys did got so much more visibility than you would have otherwise. And it's almost yeah. like it, it 10 X. So what can you tell us about what that decision did for your business over these last 12 months? It further solidified who we are in our marketplace. Um, we have a very long running head start and a very long runway. You know, the, the SEO game, the, or, the organic content game, um, it's a long play. And we don't ever want to rest on our laurels. There's, there's, I'm sure, other agents that are, you know, entering into that marketplace to say, I'm coming to get you. I'm, I'm going to compete with our website. And that's awesome. We need the competition and welcome it. Um, but we've had this site since 07. And so, we continue to make sure that we're improving it. And it's, it happens every single time we launch the site and it's day one of the launch. And we look at it and we're like, we're ready to redo it again. Like it, ne it, it's never right. You know, you can go visit it right now. And I can tell you, I love it. It's amazing. And I'm already ready for what's the next one looking like, because we're ready to, we're ready to make it better to make those improvements. Um, having evergreen content, if it's social, if it's, you know, podcast, whatever speaks to you, having it be evergreen content is the solidifying of your business for being sustainable forever. And so when agents are getting into the industry, I understand it's tough because you look at it and you're like, I just need transactions. One of the things I recommend agents do is do not go anywhere without capturing content. Everywhere you go, there should be something in your mind. What can I do around me to capture content, to continue to build a library of content? Use it today, don't use it today. Repurpose it later. You're out at a, a property, take a little pan, right? Use it on your stories, but always be thinking about what can I be doing to create content that I will use at any given point and build that library because it is, it, it, it's the game changer for you. I like that advice. And it doesn't really take that much extra time to do unless you're like sitting there and recording long form videos. But if you're just taking photos or doing little Instagram stories or little 30 second snippets here or there, it's not a big time commitment. It just takes a commitment of, you know, your consciousness. You have to mm -hmm. consciously make the decision that when you go to a listing presentation and they have an amazing fireplace that you're going to somehow document that and yep. reuse it later for something. Uh, or just the fact that you're going and, you know, here's what I did to, here's how they met me. Here's how they found me. Like there's, there's an infinite number of things you could do. It just, the only thing an agent has to do is just decide I'm going to do it. I'm going to create content wherever I go, or at least think about it. 
And yeah. at first it may be difficult and then it just becomes second nature. It does. I mean, I was out the other day and we were getting, we were running an errand and it was Jeff and I together and we had the kids in the back of the car and we were picking up lock boxes and, and, um, I was on my phone working. He is, he was driving, he stopped to get the lock boxes and he got back in the car and I was like, Oh, dang it. We forgot to take a little video of you picking up the lock boxes and just like swing them on your finger and say, we need a new home, whether we used it then or not, like it, it was irrelevant. And, and by the time I looked up, he was already pulling off and I said, we forgot to do it. And he said, you're always thinking about that stuff. And I said, well, because I, and actually I wouldn't have posted that day. I'd already posted and not, I'm very cautious about how much real estate, how much personal I post. And I, I would have just used it like maybe tomorrow, maybe three days from now, but I didn't have a photo of, you know, a lockbox going, we need a new home, right? I didn't have that, or I didn't have a 30 second video. So get in that mindset everywhere you go. You're out to dinner with family. Awesome. Whether you choose to show your kids or not, it's okay. But if you're out to dinner with family, with your spouse, with your friend, someone else needs to know why you love being at that restaurant. Because that's one of the reasons you love living where you love. So if you take a picture of, you know, the outside of the building or the, the table before you, whatever it is, capture it and then just keep it in your phone and go back to it. Because that way, I think people get hung up on this is they think the content they post has to be real time. I don't post like. I'm not posting where, where I am in this moment. I'm usually posting it a day later, or sometimes I'll post it a month later, right? Have the library. That's uh, that's smart. Um, and that's one of the, you mentioned that you don't have to put your kids in there and you don't have to post where you are at any given time. That's one of the biggest objections that I get from people that aren't doing any content at all is, well, it's a privacy thing or I, you know, I'm private and I don't want, uh, anyone to know where my kids go to school and stuff. I'm like, well, don't, don't tag the school in the post then, you know, like it, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, it, it comes down to that desire and that decision to like, I'm going to do this because this works. This will get me more business. This will help me to get my current sphere to know who I am, what I do, what my interests are, who I am as a person. And then you're likable. And then, wow, you get hired. Like it's, yep. It's just wild how that works. And so many people fight it. It's just, uh, it's weird. I, I subscribe to the document versus create rule. Um, mm. And I know there's a lot of really great creators. I, I have a lot of envy to those who have the discipline to create. It takes more practice. It takes more time blocking. I like documenting. I like, I'm in the moment. I can take a quick little video, especially with stories. I'm a big fan of that, whether it gets used in that moment or not. Um, I think that when agents get out of their own way and stop trying to get ready to get ready, like just stop it, pick up the phone, capture the moment and call it a day. Documenting what you're doing throughout the day is a much easier barrier of entry into being a content creator than saying, oh, but I'm going to, I'm going to wait until I do this and I got to have it produced and I got to edit it. Never mind all that get into the arena, just start documenting. Where were you today? I stopped and got a great coffee. Awesome. Take a cup, take a photo of the coffee cup and say, I had the best barista today. Loved this coffee. Thank you so much. Like document the day. Why you love living somewhere. I hope y'all are living where you actually sell homes, but why you love living there is what will attract the customer to you. So show them what's amazing about where you live. That is going to be that attraction marketing instead of here's the house I just listed or here's, I, I very seldomly post like here's my just listed on my personal stuff, unless it's, you know, a one-off for the most part, it's all just, here's what I'm doing throughout my day. Perfect. I want to talk about, I want to dive a little deeper on this because, uh, you know, agents, they don't need, consumers don't need us to find houses anymore. There's a million different websites, yours, and then Zillow, Redfin, and a million others where they can find their own damn house. They need us for everything else. Okay. And they, they need you for your expertise. So one of the easiest ways to show that you are a local expert is just to live in your community and to show people, Hey, I'm like you said, Oh, I just discovered this great new coffee shop. For example, um, this, uh, some of the restaurants and the places that me and my family like to go the most, we saw somebody else recommend on their Instagram story. Yeah. I love discovering places that way. And when I discover it from 
this this guy named Dan Young that I watched a story the other day and learned about this churro place in Sugar House, Utah. And we went later that afternoon. Um, I'm like, well, I can't help but think of Dan as like he he's somewhat of an expert on the cool things to do in that area. He's yeah. not. He he founded a PC he founded PC laptops, uh, you know, a, a computer repair company. But <laughs> So if you are the one that are constantly like recommending restaurants or food trucks or splash pads or, you know, indoor amusement parks, you're the local expert. And that's a big part of being a real estate agent, or at least in why people hire a real estate agent is for that local expertise. And it's so easy to establish yourself as that just by showing what you're doing. So um, not to mention, if you find some little coffee shop or a little hamburger joint or whatever, and it's not this big chain and you recommend it you're helping that business. You're actually helping them to get more business and keeping more money in your community versus them going to Starbucks. So there's this one coffee shop. Uh, it, it's not even a shop. It's like a little drive through thing. You know, one of those little boxes in, the, in, in a parking lot near my kid's school. And so uh, whenever I drop my son off in the mornings, I grab a coffee on the way out and it is the best coffee in Salt Lake, I believe. And it's, it's this lady that owns that place. She's owned it for 20 years. A Starbucks just opened across the street six months ago. And uh, she's still doing well because it's the local place that people really love. And she gets most of her, most of her new clients. Somebody else told them about it. Yeah, That's telling. And I, that should not be understated because you can have a big impact in your community by just sharing what you like about it. I love the supporting small business side of this equation, especially when we've all been going through what we've been going through with COVID. Um, one of the things that our team launched into, I believe it was around June of 2020, we did a pretty strong push for about a month or two of the summer that we were just, how can we spread positivity? Now, as realtors, we know how incredibly impactful reviews mean to us. So I realized one day I was on Instagram, just like you're mentioning, and I like finding businesses on Instagram because I like to support them, especially the last 12 months. So I started thinking, what if we go out and when we truly have received great service, we have to actually, actually been a consumer of this product, then leave positive reviews no expectation, just, I want to go spread positivity. When someone leaves me a review, it's like I do cartwheels down the road. They're hard to, uh, they're hard to procure. They're hard to get. You have to work your tail off to actually even earn a review. And then you have to hope maybe that somebody does it because it's much, we're much more inclined to leave negative reviews than we are positive. Oh, yeah. That's it. So around June, the team set out to do spread positivity. And all we did is we, every Friday when we would meet for our um, weekly team meeting, we would say, here's the companies that we left positive reviews for. And maybe it was the coffee shop. Maybe it was the car dealership. Maybe it was the uh, mobile detailer, whomever it was that was local. We left a positive review. We left them everywhere. Yelp, Google, Facebook, you name it. It's really easy. It takes two seconds. What we found by doing that our goal was just to spread positivity and share some really great positive reviews for, cons for um, companies who had served us well. What we found is that the businesses called us and started having conversations with us. And That's so cool. what are we all seeking in the real estate industry? We're seeking conversations. We had more conversations based on that. We couldn't believe it. Because here we are, like we're in the midst of a pandemic. It's not a fun time. And we had all these businesses calling, oh my gosh, thank you so much. That meant the most. And quite frankly, I was doing it for companies that I wasn't a consumer of recently. I even went back and like, where have I been in the last six months? And I looked at the Google map and I was like, oh, I was here. I was here. I was here. So I started leaving reviews through Google and they would call. It's amazing what happens. So think about ways you can spread positivity, support small business is key. Some people interview business owners. I think that's amazing. You can do that. You don't have to. A simple story on Instagram goes a long way. Like I was at one of my favorite little, we went uh, spring break last week and we went to our favorite Oceanside restaurant. It's this tiny little restaurant. It's been there for decades and decades. And I just posted up, here I am, the outside of the building, funk family favorite. We love snack jacks. Every time we're on the coast, we go there. 
And then of course the business is sharing it out and they send me a DM. Thank you so much. It's so nice of you to share your support. That is exactly what you're talking about, Dustin. And that starts conversations and it also helps those local businesses. Absolutely. I, I love that. Let's jump back to operating a high powered real estate business like you guys do. What are some of the, the tactical things that you're doing right now to get business that your agents are doing to get business? What's working in this crazy competitive low inventory market? And then I want to talk to you about uh, your sponsorship of the Orlando Magic because I think that's interesting. Oh my goodness. So these times, these times are interesting. I'm in Orlando, Florida. And one of the really interesting things about our market, we have two markets here. We have a segment of our market. That's a vacation home, second home market, which is highly, highly driven by the tourism industry. As you can imagine, we live in the world of Mickey Mouse, thank goodness. Um, but it's taken a bit of a beating. Uh, we actually have some of those second home markets that are still a buyer's market. So we're very fortunate, although we are starting to see some shifts in that as well. It's still prime for some investors to come in. Our second segment, of course, is our primary residence market. We have never, I say we, Jeff and I, he's been licensed 21 years. I've been licensed seven. We have never seen a market like we have right now. I mean, it's very much a seller's market. Our inventory uh, for that segment is probably at about a month, a month of inventory. In our year over year, home values have increased 17%, which wow, crazy. Um, I like to make the distinction because of this is that our, our agents, I think every agent everywhere, you have to be grittier than you've ever been before. I'm a big mindset person. I believe that we put out into the world what our internal words, when we talk to ourselves internally, when we have that internal dialogue, if we constantly run around and say, it's so hard, it's so hard, it's so hard, guess what's going to happen? It's gonna be hard. It's going to be hard. It's interesting times. And what we are finding is the agents who have the grit and tenacity to go out there and make it happen, they're making it happen. Is it um, challenging? Yes, it can be. But here's one of the things that I remind all of us, myself included, we have learned more lessons in the last year than we have in a very long time. And that's exciting because we're becoming stronger realtors. So what are we doing? We're getting gritty, right? There, there's agents door knocking. There's agents, you know, when they're calling expireds, they're not looking at expired. You can't look at expireds. There aren't very many for the last three months. They're going back 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. Do you know? And it, it's just looking at different ways to find the inventory. Um, for us as well, we have different markets. Like our, we have different foreign national markets who perhaps once purchased here and they might be thinking about selling. So it's looking at who might be in the market who may not realize and doing your very best. Um, what, what once maybe took 40 calls takes 80 calls. You know, if you're making 50 calls in a week, guess what? You probably need to make a hundred now. That's but so encouraging though, I think. It's opportunity, Dustin. Yes. It's how we look at it. It's it, So what? Get over it. This is what we have. This is called an opportunity of growth. And let me just share one more thing, if you don't mind. Sure. I wasn't a realtor in the downturn of 2000, you know, eight, nine, 10. I was married to one though. And it was not a fun time for a lot of realtors. Happened to be the biggest blessing for my family because that's, if you look back, we built our site in 2007. And so while a lot of realtors were falling apart because there was an economical collapse, we were the only ones, one of them who had a site. And so everybody was coming to our site who was investing in Orlando. When I think about what we're going through right now, another reason why it's not scary is because when you are faced with areas of improvement or you're faced with challenge, that literally equals opportunity. So right. I look at this time as how gritty can you get? Because those that get gritty are going to come out so strong and it's exciting. It can be exciting if you look at it that way. It absolutely can be. And the reason I say it's encouraging is if, if you know that you just have to work harder than you did two years ago, guess what? We control that. There's no one else that controls how many calls you make, how many doors you knock on, how many pieces of content you post, except for you you control it. And yeah. so if you control it, that means you control it. And sure, there's other market forces out there, but 
it's it be it's still a numbers game. I don't care what I don't care which market you're in. It's it's a numbers game. Maybe those numbers are hard. Maybe those numbers suck compared to what you're used to, but you still control whether or not you're going to go through the numbers to get the results because the vast majority of agents will not. They won't even in a balanced market. They won't even in a, a solid market. I don't even know why I said solid. I don't even know what the hell that means. But in, in an easier market, um, for, from whichever side of the market they're on, you control it. And, and so that's encouraging. And I hope that you guys listening take that to heart. Um, and it, you mentioned the fun. skills too. Go ahead. It's not fun. I, I mean, I have the most amount of grace and like virtual hugs and love sent to the buyer's agents. It's hard. If you know an agent that is out there representing buyers, you send, give them a real hug or send them a virtual hug. It is hard in most cases. But here's the thing. We meet, for example, you know, a differentiator for us is we meet five mornings a week as a team. And what dominates our conversations every single morning now is this. If we didn't, if we submit an offer as a team and it wasn't accepted, we're going to go over it with a fine tooth comb and figure out what area could we have improved on? Where did we fall short? Is it inspection periods? Is it a pre what, what is the term? How could we make it more appealing? And how do we get creative to help each individual team member look at it with the next customer, serving that customer at the highest level and saying, let's go in here, consider this as an approach, right? It's lit, I feel like it's every morning. I don't, I couldn't imagine even after my years of experience or the collective years, if we didn't have a place to go every morning to lean into each other, to say, here's the customer, here's what they're seeking. Here's what we're going to write. Does this make sense? Does this sound like it's a competitive, like we lean into that. We're not alone. And I, that's important. And you're polishing your skills when it's, when it's super hard and you have to get really dialed in and just really tight on everything. Then when things do become a little bit easier, you're going to mop up. You're going to absolutely clean up because you will, you will have become one of the best. And, and then when it becomes more balanced market or even a, a, a buyer's market, you're going to get everything. You're going to absolutely clean up. And, and, so I wish people had a little bit more long-term thinking of like, okay, this it's hard. It sucks. It's more difficult, uh, a little scary. Cause maybe your pipelines, thin. you don't know where your next deal is coming from, but that's when, if you double down and really get good at those skills and audit your offers, the way you guys do as a team, which is an incredible tip, you become one of the best because you are, are consciously working on it and not just, not just doing what agents do in a balanced market. And they're just like, yeah, here you go. And every once in a while they'll, they'll get those. And they're like, Oh, I guess I, I guess I'm doing what it takes to be a great buyer's agent. <laughs> so that's cool. I, I, uh, I, I'm impressed that you guys meet five days a week and go over that stuff. And just, just that alone, the fact that you do that shows why you guys are head and shoulders above the rest. Uh, because most won't do that. I mean, once a week is a pain in the ass for, for most people let alone five days a week. So, well, in all fairness, just see so for context, we meet four, four mornings a week for 15 minutes each morning. What challenges have we had? What successes have we had? How can we help each other? 15 minutes in out rapid fire. Here's what I have. Here's my situation. Uh, and then Fridays are our team meeting. So a little bit more entailed, but nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's crazy when you think about those meetings two to three months ago, were very different than they are now because pretty much every morning is what are we going to do to make sure that we're poising our customer for the best, strongest offer based on their needs and their everything they're seeking to achieve? That's what our conversation is. And guess what? I don't have all the answers. Not any one of us does, but the collective power of the collaboration, that's where you go, oh, have you tried this? Oh, did you think about this? Did your customer consider this, right? That's where it gets real good. I'm so grateful for the tribe. That's awesome. Well, Renee, you, you also are official sponsors of the Orlando Magic. How does that come about? How does, if, if you have Sally, the agent, that's like, I'm going to go sponsor an NBA team too. I assume you have to qualify somehow or be approved to do it. Like, can you demystify this whole like sponsoring an NBA team thing? Because I know the only other agent or 
team that I know of that sponsors a, a professional team is Gary Ashton with the Titans in um, Nashville. Yep. I'm sure there's a bunch of others. I just don't know them. Uh, how does that come about? Well, first of all, props to Gary Ashton, because you are right. We're, uh, we're big Gary Ashton fans. He, um, he may have been a little bit of the reason why uh, it was Jeff's BHAG. If you've ever heard of the acronym BHAG, Big Hairy Audacious Goal. Um, way back when, you know, we would go to real estate conferences and we were at many with, with Gary and, you know, Gary was like, oh, he's always been right. Like he's amazing. And he would have these big, awesome things he was accomplishing still to this day. And I remember Jeff and I, mm, seven years ago, we were at a real estate conference and we said, well, that would be really neat. Like, how do you, how do you do, how do you do that? And so you set a big, hairy, audacious goal. And it's not to think you don't think it's going to come true, but it's that like, it's insane in your mind. You're like, that's insane. How would we do that? We're so small. We could never do that. <sighs> well, we did it. And it's incredible to have that feeling of knowing that you set a goal and it was a, like up on a wall of like maybe one day. And then in um, the fall of 2019, it became official. Um, Jeff and I launched a partnership with the NBA, the Orlando Magic. Uh, we have a multi-year partnership with the Orlando Magic. Now notice I said fall of 2019. I do like to point that out because then what happened in March? <laughs> yeah, the Rudy Gobert ended up getting COVID and then the rest is history. I remember that. So um, we're learning a lot. I always like to say, listen for the lessons. Oh my gosh, we're going to be so incredibly strong when we finally come out the other side of this pandemic, because when you make one of the biggest investments you've ever made in your business into a partnership and a pandemic hits, it's not so much fun, but it is a partnership. Um, we're getting through it. We see some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, as far as how does one achieve it? A bit of our pathway started with this. If you want to start sponsoring teams, start super hyper local. So go to the local schools, go as hyper local as an elementary school, a middle school, high school, all of the above. Go to your sports teams. If sports are back in action, go to them right now. They need and want your support. Start there. Um, we've also been the title sponsor. We're on year six of our children's school. Our children's school is, um, it's Windermere Prep. So it's a local school here in Windermere. That's the area I live in outside of Orlando. And that's um, all three schools on one campus. And we've been the title sponsor there for six years. We've supported other uh, local initiatives and just started to, to grow over time. Does sponsorship work? Can you see a direct... Um, can you see it affecting your, your bottom line or your, your top line? I should say. You mean the Orlando magic? Any of them? Because I know so there's a, they all, uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Especially hyper-local. I hmm. am going to just in full transparency, think about when we launched our par partnership fall of 2019 pandemic yeah. hit. We now have an arena with about 10% mm, occupancy. It's not the perfect situation. Um, the great news is we have multiple years, so we're in it. It's going to improve. Um, I would say my number one piece of advice, whether you go at it hyper local or you go professional, understand this. It's kind of like those pesky postcards you talk about when people say postcards and farming don't work. Actually, they do work. It's what is your expectation? Because if your expectation is that you're going to decide to do a postcard farming campaign and you're going to commit to a solid 18 months before you even have an expectation that there's an ROI, I promise you every time you will come out on the other end with promise and an ROI that's going to make you happy. It's only when we enter into any kind of business decision that we think, well, what, what's the, what's the immediate, right? And sometimes there can be, um, we've never entered into any kind of sports marketing, whether it's hyper-local or otherwise, and expected to have a turnaround next month. It's, it's a long-term, uh, investment. And I, I would say, yes, it's absolutely worth it. And that, that context there was kind of what I was trying to get at with does sponsorship work? I mean, some of the biggest, most successful brands in the world, put, they'll spend a hundred million bucks to put their name on the side of an arena or a baseball stadium, like Coca-Cola. 
well, we all know who Coke is, right? It's not like they need to teach the world who they are. It's that when you're thirsty and you look up and you're like, oh, I'd like a Coke, please. Uh, and, and it gives credibility to the brand. So uh, when I was really struggling as an agent, I would do uh, postcards, for example, but I would only do postcards. I'm like this, this one campaign, these one or two mailers, that's it. That's my ticket. But it, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's all everything that you're doing. And so now when, when, you know, people in the community go to a magic game or they watch them on TV or they go to their kids high school baseball game or whatever, and they see you guys, and then they see you in their, in their mailbox with a postcard, and then they see you in a Facebook ad, and then they see you over here and over there. That is why it all works. Yes. That's called marketing gold. So yes. that goes back to a tip I give agents on day one, when they start with me. When you're crafting your list of your sphere of influence, your network, all of your contacts, don't even talk to me about what those contacts are until you have the following name, phone number, mailing address, email address. You must have all four of those criteria from anybody that you consider to be in your sphere of influence or personal network, because without that four criteria all together, it's piecemealing an approach. But if you have all four, that's marketing gold. So when I go out to dinner or I go really anywhere anymore, go pick up the kids from school or whatever, it's very common that someone's going to say, oh my goodness, you guys are everywhere. Well, actually we're not everywhere. We're just everywhere in front of the people that know who we are. It's not a coincidence. It's very um, strategic. And we do postcards. We personally don't farm anymore. We do postcards to those who already know, like, and trust us and previous customers. So they're getting exactly what you said, Dustin, social media, in the mail, tangible, email, phone calls, customer appreciation events. We want them to come back soon. They're not quite there yet. Um, and then of course, our fixtures in the community through philanthropy and our sports marketing. I, that, I think that right there is worth the price of admission for this podcast. It, understanding that every single thing that you do, it all works together. You can't just do one thing and expect that, oh, that, you know, you're going to close hundred homes this year. It, it snowballs. It has to be a cumulative effort and it has to keep going. And you can be everywhere for a certain group of people when no one else knows who you are, but the right people know who you are because they see you everywhere. A banner ad, a Facebook ad, an Instagram swipe up story ad, mailer, door hanger, banner in the outfield of the baseball field, you know, all that stuff. So that's cool. Um, Renee, whenever we have a guest on, we like to do these rapid fire questions and get to know you a little bit better. And these are mostly marketing related, but some are just for fun, either or questions. You can pick one or the other and you don't need to elaborate unless you want to. And then, <laughs> uh -oh, then we'll wrap it trouble. up. <laughs> Definitely in trouble. Yeah. Huge trouble. Uh, but then afterwards we'll let people uh, give you a chance to let everyone know where they can find you and follow you and see what you and your team are doing and all of that good stuff. And of course, we'll link to your social media and your website and everything in the show notes of the podcast and the description if you're watching on YouTube. Ready for the rapid fire? Let's do it. All right. Facebook or Instagram? Most recently, Instagram. Okay. And I have to, I have to iterate on that. I only started doing Instagram open to the public for, for a more business standpoint in June of 2020, believe it or not. Ah, but now I love it. Better late than never, I guess, right? Yeah. And it for me, it took a minute to learn. I used to hate Instagram until I got it and it was just playing around on it for a while. And I was like, oh, I get this. This is actually kind of cool. It's just different than Facebook. And now I, re I really like Instagram too. Instagram or LinkedIn? LinkedIn. LinkedIn, LinkedIn or Clubhouse? Is oh my gosh. So there... Oh, they're really close. So LinkedIn is one of the most undervalued social media platforms. Yes. Clubhouse, especially in our brokerage, like the Clubhouse platform has spoken to, to me very clearly because it's very similar to where we host our morning meetings in our brokerage in our cloud office. Hmm. Clubhouse has the most insane relationship building opportunities I have seen ever. Um, yeah. in fact, just in a matter of what, 
I think I've been on two months. I think I'm closing in on 9,000 followers. I don't even know how that's happening. I, I like, I'm it, that, that blows my mind. If you're not on clubhouse, get on clubhouse, but I'm also a big LinkedIn fan. LinkedIn's that's like incredible. asking me to pick between my kids, Dustin. That's, I like how we work from Instagram to LinkedIn and then to clubhouse there. Uh, but I I'm with you. We're, we're having this conversation. We're doing this podcast because of clubhouse. Because, uh, like I told you to begin with, I've known who you are and you know, I've, I'm like Renee's killing it. You know, she's, she's a great thought leader in our industry, but we'd never spoken. And I don't think I'd ever heard you talk until clubhouse. And then, uh, I was, I may as well tell everyone else you are leading, or you're one of the, the women leading this, like empowering women in real estate rooms. And I was just a fly on the wall listening, but there was this one dude that insisted on, on diving in and like dominating the conversation. I'm like, did you read what this room is called guy? And you handled it so diplomatically and so well. And I'm like, wow, she like, wow, that's awesome. I got to have her on my show. And <laughs> and that kind of spurred this whole thing. So Clubhouse really does create, well, it can, it can foster relationships in a very, very, very powerful way. Uh, I completely agree. Clubhouse is, it, it's totally different than everything else, but uh, worth your time. Absolutely. Clubhouse is eating into and has almost completely replaced. I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it. my Facebook time. Mm -hmm. Facebook has taken a beaten in my world. And I don't, I, I'm mostly just organic on Facebook. We do some retargeting as far as ad campaigns and things, but I, oh, Clubhouse, it's relationships first. It is my jam. I love anywhere we can go where it's come from contribution, earn the relationship. And that is what happening on Clubhouse. Plus, so I, Dustin, I don't know if you've ever heard of our founder, Glenn Sanford. He uses this phrase, um, serendipitous, meaningful collisions. Hmm. And I love that serendipitous, meaningful collisions. Glenn Sanford will reference like that's what happens in our cloud office. And that's awesome. But that's what happens on Clubhouse. And it's so much fun because you get to you get to network um, our referrals. We've already had two referrals in two months come in. I, it. I'm a fan. Let's connect and there. In fact, Dustin, we need to do this in Clubhouse too. We do. I, I think that'd be fine if, if we did a, a room together in Clubhouse. And speaking of Glenn Sanford, didn't he meet Grant Cardone on Clubhouse? And didn't that relationship start on Clubhouse? That's incredible. hundred percent. A hundred percent. Is, is that so crazy cool. or what? It, it's it's not. I like it is, but it's it's not. If you understand Clubhouse and you've spent enough time there and know how it works you're just able to have conversations with people that maybe you never would have had access to before or just never met before. And now you're like, oh my gosh, we're hitting it off. And you're just like me and wow, great idea. We should be friends. And it's, it's just wild. So serendipitous, right. meaningful collisions. I like that. And he is a genius. And so of course, he really is. I would agree with you on that. <laughs> yes. Books or podcasts. Mm, podcasts, podcasts or audiobooks. Audiobooks. iPhone or Android? iPhone. Oh my gosh! Of course. Kind of, kind of a stupid question, right? <laughs> yeah. Alexa or Google Home? Oh, you're going to activate her. <laughs> She's always listening. The nope. A word. Yeah. The, the, my kids love asking her questions, like, "How big is Jupiter?" and stuff like that. When we first had our first one in the house, this was years ago, whenever they first came out, my little guy at that time, I think he must've been like seven, he was playing with it. And Jeff went to the grocery store and he, Jeff comes home and he's like, he bought all this stuff. I'm like, why'd you buy this? But he's like, it was on the list. I said, no, it wasn't. He said, yeah, it was. <laughs> so then fast forward a few more days, Jeff goes back to the store and he calls me and he says, do you know what's on the list? I said, no. He says, lightsabers. <laughs> so our little guy was putting things on the list. And then the next time around, he had lightsabers on the list. Then we figured out what was going on. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, An Amazon genius. I mean, you know, awesome. All right. Burgers or pizza? Pizza. New York or LA? New York. I'm with you on that. NFL or NBA? NBA. Of course. <laughs> You know, I, uh, I love the magic back at when, when, how old was I? This was like early nineties, I think, right? Like with Shaq and Penny Hardaway, was that nineties? 
Mm, I think so. I think that was nineties. Well, no, 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 no. Shaq on the magic would have been after that. When you say nineties, I'm thinking like early nineties is bad boys. So I'm from Michigan originally. Uh, Pistons. So I'm like Detroit Pistons and bad boys and John Sally and like all those guys. That's, that's to me, my early nineties crew. I'm trying to remember when we, we, we could Google it. Google it. Shaq was on the magic. I don't think it was 90s. I think it was in the 2000s. That could be. That could be. Anyway, I think we're getting older, Dustin. We're getting older. I've noticed that lately. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've certainly noticed that. All right. Baseball or football? Neither. Fair enough. But I will say this. So with the fact that I'm really not interested in, in baseball or football, I did write a LinkedIn article um, during the pandemic. And a few people were like, why are you writing about the NFL? I have no business writing about the NFL, but the LinkedIn article I wrote about was about the draft because NFL, I thought were so amazing during the pandemic, they decided they were one of the first organizations to say to heck with it we're not waiting. Like one of the things we said all of 2020 is if you're waiting, you're in trouble. We Mm -hmm. didn't wait for anything. We got into motion. We might've made mistakes, but we knew we were going to forge ahead despite any uncertainty through a pandemic as realtors and a real estate industry. Don't wait for anything. I was so proud to see that the NFL said, well, are we going to delay the draft? Are we going to do right? All these things? No, they just did it remotely. And so I wrote an article on LinkedIn talking about kudos to them for no waiting, do it remotely, figure out a way. It might not be perfect, but so what? And I thought that was really, really smart of them. So this average girl, realtor in Orlando wrote an article about the NFL. And I really don't know much about the NFL, but I thought that was important. Well, that's cool. Cause the NFL gets dumped on quite a bit, which they deserve, but that's a good point. Like they, they're like, we have the technology here, people. Let's just, let's get it done. And it, the drafts are important because like that changes families' lives. You know, that there's these kids that have spent their entire lives and not just the kids, but their families that have, you know, worked multiple jobs and given up so much so that their kids can have the chance to go to the NFL draft and then to have it just not happen. Or, you know, when college football looked like that wasn't going to happen, uh, that really hurts a lot of people. So, um, you know, you're right. Kudos to them. I think that's, I hadn't really thought of it like that, but good for them. When, when we're in uncertainty, we can do two things. We can either freeze out of fear of making a mistake in a decision we're going to make, or we can move forward and learn from whatever the outcome is going to be. And that even in the fear and, and guess what? Nobody had a bigger moment. I shouldn't say it that way. We all had big moments in March where we were like, oh my gosh, this is really tough. And when we were woke up on March 12th, and said, the NBA is closing, Uh, not so much fun. There was probably a few tears shed here. Day goes by, we wake up the next day and we say, that's it, we're in motion. We don't know a lot of what's going to happen, but we know one thing, we know exactly what to do. We know what to pour into. We know what content to create. We know to be present with the agents and stand in solidarity and and say, I may not have all the answers, but we're in it together and we're gonna get through it together. And we're stronger because of it, all of us. Love it, absolutely. Uh, Mountains or beach? Oh, you keep giving me these tough ones. Mountains in the summer. Fair enough. Podcast or vlog? Oh, podcast. YouTube or Facebook Live? Facebook Live, but I'm getting into YouTube. Yeah, me too. Uh, Rich dad, poor dad, or millionaire real estate agent? Millionaire real estate, but we just bought... What's the board game from Rich Dad Poor Ga- Dad? Oh, um, cash flow. We just bought that, and I don't That's know anything game. about it. I've had so many people recommend reading the book and getting the game, so we just bought the game. So next time we have a conversation, I'll share more about it. Nice. I haven't played that in years. That's a fun game. Uber or Lyft? Lyft. Gary V or Grant Cardone? <gasps> you did not. Always have. Oh my god. <laughs> um, okay, Always so will. let's. I let's just go with, here's the thing. I have been um, really grateful for years and years and years of Gary V in my world. A lot of what I've learned from, um, come from contribution perspective, um, has been as a result of consuming his content. Um, 
in all fairness, I'm an, I'm a newer consumer to the Grant Cardone machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm going to say Gary V, but, um, they both bring a lot to the table to be learning and understanding. Totally. I, I, I agree with that. All right, Renee, what is, give us an app recommendation. Are there any new apps that you're, that you're playing around with that you love? Well, it may not be new to some, but I am surprised at how people, people aren't using it. Um, genius scan. <laughs> I, this may sound so dry, but I still have people say like, I'm going to drive somewhere to fax something or not fax or scan. And I'll right. say, what do you skip? Genius scan is amazing. You just like click, take a photo, boom, you have a PDF. So I'm a big yes. fan of genius scan, um, app clubhouse clubhouse. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm a huge fan of workplace. We use workplace. I'm real big on workplace that's internal for our brokerage and, uh, LinkedIn. I just kind of went off my main screen. The most valuable real estate in the world right here. The, the this, this right here, you know, people will say how you update your phone a lot. I'm like, yeah, this is my moneymaker. This is our office. It's funny this to me. People are like, that's a $1,400 <laughs> phone. I'm like, it's a $1,400 $1, business. Like business right? manager. Uh, it's everything. It's yeah. Yeah. It's everything. And it's like, of course, like it's our whole world. It's all on here. And so um, make sure it's on point because this can change your world. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And your, um, your, your case right there on your phone, my wife wants a Tesla with that finish on it. <gasps> we, saw one in, um, we saw one in Pacific Beach last summer. It was a Tesla Model S. And I just that ordered that car, but not in this color. Really? I did. I'm waiting on Elon. He's a little delayed. I don't know what's up. Could you have his number? Can we call him? Because my Model S is a little delayed delivery. What's up with that? You could tweet him. <laughs> I think, or, or Clubhouse. You might just be able to jump on stage with him on Clubhouse. Yeah. Renee Funk's order. Come on. It was March 2020. <laughs> uh, I think they're they're experiencing high demand right now, Renee. Yeah, I know. I know that mm -hmm. and that darn cyber truck. We're, we're Tesla family. We like Tesla. So Jeff's waiting for the cyber truck. Nice. We haven't gotten our first one yet. We almost got a model Y a few months ago. Um, I think we're going to wait for the X, the new X with like the crazy steering wheel. It's like half a steering wheel, you know? Yeah. Be careful. They're addicting. We had one yep. and uh, I fell in love. I was totally ambivalent before. And then I was like, nope, I want one now. It's my turn. I love They're an They're experience. Amazing. And it for is. anyone who hasn't driven a Tesla, just go rent one. Uh, we've rented a few of them on Turo and, you know, a hundred, 120 bucks a day or whatever. And you can get a Model S, a Model X, a Model Y, whatever. Um, it's just such a cool way. Just drive it around for a few days, throw your, your um, car seats in there with your kids and go take, my kids love the whoopee cushion thing, uh, you know, the whoopee cushion mode. Oh, I know. But, I know. Yeah. No, that and um, when it's yeah. cold out. I'm going to just tell you, there's been a couple of times the Funk family goes into the garage and we turn the Yule log on yes. and it heats up the seats and sends out warm air. I don't know. We're kind of geeky like that. But think <laughs> about Tesla. The thing about what you just said, you are correct. Just go drive one. You fall in love. I was totally like, what's the big deal? It's just another car. That's a lifestyle change. We're going to have to plug it in. Why do we want one of those? And then you experience it. And branding is about how it makes us feel. And driving one of those cars makes you feel a certain way. It's just, and you, you can't explain it until you get in it. It's like, okay, I, this, I have to have my name on this. So got to love a Tesla. I do. And I do. Absolutely. Renee, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm so glad that we were able to connect on clubhouse and, um, and for you being willing to do the show and for sharing your wisdom, uh, you're doing some really cool stuff for anyone that doesn't know you yet, or doesn't follow you yet. Where can they find you online? LinkedIn, as I said, I'm a big LinkedIn fan. Um, I know a lot of people are on Instagram. So if you want to connect on Instagram, it's at Renee underscore funk. And we will link to those in the show notes of the podcast, wherever you're listening. And if you're watching on YouTube in the description, so make sure you go check out Renee and follow her. Renee, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I had so much fun. I'm coming to see you soon. Remember? Absolutely. Yeah. We'll see you this summer. All right. Take care. Thank you so much, Dustin. You bet. Bye.